again, dear friends, and welcome to the Stephen Mendes channel. Thanks for stopping by. Today we're looking at all the reasons why you might not want to buy vintage synthesizers. I just watched a YouTube video by the Synth Punk. It was most uh, enlightening and nostalgic for me because I came up in the age when uh, electronic music was being born and uh, all of the Moog and uh, sequential circuits and um, of course Roland was still around back then and so was Yamaha with the CS series synthesizers and I even had a CS10 and um, it was very nostalgic uh, time of life. I was probably in my teenage years and um, early 20s when uh, that was going on and I got to thinking maybe I would like to uh, buy some of those uh, synthesizers and uh, I thought long and hard about it in 2015 when I made the purchase of the uh, synthesizers.com modular and the reason why I settled on the synthesizers.com modular instead of all of these other vintage synthesizers was because it was a modern synthesizer that was modeled after the Moog but was totally built with modern components and had stable analog oscillators that we can rely on. Yet there is really a side to this equation that people are not paying attention to and that is that all electronics, particular analog electronics is not very good at keeping uh, currents and voltages stable over the long haul. You have to have temperature compensation and uh, there is things like thermal runaway which was more prevalent in older um, components. Uh, the other thing is that the IC chips and the transistors that were stirring in the 70s were not the best. They used to fail far more regularly than today's product. We've perfected the integrated circuit manufacturing process and uh, once it has no latent defects, we don't ever expect to have a service problem with the current gear but the older gear is not like that I was an electronics technician uh, primarily serving servicing the musical community on the island where I live back in the 70s late 70s and throughout the 80s and I can tell you for a fact that the transistors and components that were used used to fail at that time the bands were playing with organs, um, very few people had synthesizers or maybe they had a small synthesizer like I did, a CS10 on top of a, a Yamaha organ. I had the uh, Yamaha portable organ and um, well through the band that I was playing in. But the thing about it is that you have to understand that that was an era in electronics that was changing at a very rapid pace with each passing year advances in the material purity and the manufacturing processes were taking place at a very rapid rate the farther back you go with a vintage synth the more likely it's going to be to require some sort of remedial work. Now, there's a number of guys 
who are on YouTube and I guess you can get their contact information and uh, maybe they will accept uh, synthesizers from you anywhere in the world but it's obviously going to be cheaper for you if you live near to where they're operating but apparently these guys go all over the states in a van picking up old synthesizers and refurbishing them and then selling them for a, a fantastic markup um, they, there is one video there where they sold a CS80 for ridiculous price to somebody that desperately wanted one and um, the CS80, a, a working CS80 now does fetch a tremendous price compared to what it sold for back in the 80s it wasn't cheap back then and now it's, it's even higher but if you engage the services of these guys who restore these synthesizers with love um, and find alternative parts to use because there's always some sort of remedial work you can do you can change the circuit you can use different ICs you can put piggyback boards on top of other boards there's always a way around the problem the question is how much are you willing to pay a lot of those chips were custom developed, they were made in limited quantity and uh, repair of some of those synthesizers uh, involves finding another one to get it out of. If you can find another synthesizer of the same type and the chip is not bad in that one then you can take it out and put it in and uh, you will gain some additional life on your instrument but there is no modern uh, part that you can simply stick in there you may have to actually redesign the circuit to use modern equipment one of the beauties of the synthesizers.com system is that Roger Arick took the trouble to go and redesign the circuits using modern readily available components that are so it is easily maintainable they are costly components as you would expect because you would want stability in the oscillators you would want quality low noise in the filters and all that sort of stuff but he has succeeded in making a totally analog recreation of the Moog at a fraction of the cost and his synthesizers are used all over the world by musicians who, de who definitely want to achieve that legendary sound. This is a valuable piece of equipment and it's, get, it's going up higher because of the fact that it's made in limited quantities, the modules are limited in quantity and the cost of manufacturing them is quite high because they, they leave no um, no stone unturned, it's hand done in, in top quality just like Moog it's not a mass produced process by any means and each module when you take it out you know has an inspection and, and a couple of signatures on the back to certify that it was tested and calibrated, who it was tested and calibrated by and uh, that brings us to the next uh, point, calibration even if you don't have a physical failure of a component the calibration can be quite problematic for the general public who doesn't have access to test equipment and doesn't understand or know how to do their own electronics if I was living in the United States I would probably open a synthesizer business because the time is right to make a killing on repairing them they're very expensive anyway the people who are the like synth punk who are very um, anxious to keep these sounds have to pay have to expect to pay more now the thing about it is after you've acquired one if you've acquired one on reverb or ebay or wherever you buy it from if it's in good repair and it came that way uh, you probably stand a chance of getting a little use out of it before something fails but the thing about electronics is that it's not really a question of if it fails it's a question of when and an, and an item 
such as a synthesizer that has been built 40 or 50 years ago is definitely going to have some sort of failure at some point in time. I have a bit of vintage gear in my studio from the 70s and 80s but I purchased it first hand direct and so I know how it has been cared for and in any case I have a service manual so if there's anything that needs to be done I can get it attended to personally so I wouldn't have a repair bill or I wouldn't have a repair men going at it to cause more trouble but it's, it's, it's sort of like a car as you get somebody going in it then a whole string of things begin to give trouble uh, particularly if they're not careful so basically what is your choice if you're not an electronics person and you can't maintain vintage equipment yourself then you have to have a good electronic shop who takes care of you most good electronic shops who take care of you are going to increase their cost particularly in the time when parts are hard to come by and they may have to reinvent or redesign parts of the circuit because of an, uh, a problem where they cannot even get a part. Now it stands to reason that people who have a whole room full of ancient gear are using climate control systems that provide accurate humidity, keep the humidity constant, and temperature so that the electronics is preserved as long as possible. Now for those of you who want the sound of the instrument but don't want the trouble of actually having the physical electronics hardware and having to maintain it and store it and uh, fix it, there is Arturia V Collection. The Arturia V Collection has a CS80, it has in a Profit, and it has in many of the other early models of synthesizers as well as a software instrument. And Arturia is very good at producing an accurate sound. So the presets on the soft synth, the soft CX80, uh, CS80, the, the presets on the soft CS80 are going to sound pretty much the same as the presets on the hardware. The only thing that will be missing is the wonderful tactile sensation of running your fingers over the knobs, sliders, and actual physical animal. You can control it from a MIDI controller, uh, but it's not quite the same thing as owning a CS80. However, the sound-wise, you would be hard pressed to tell the difference. People will say they can tell the difference, but the average person would not be able to tell the difference. And definitely Arturia has gone to the trouble to get the sound certified by the original people, so they would have good ears and they would have been able to certify the sound as authentic and original. So it would make sense to buy these vintage synthesizers as software recreations rather than try to deal with the vintage hardware. That would be an economic and sensible decision if you must have that sound. However, in my case, and this is unique, to me and other people who do not live in the major city of the US there is an additional problem we are 3,000 miles away on an island where everything has to come and go by FedEx DHL or Le Parkin or UPS under the close scrutiny of customs where multiple forms have to be filled out and the government wants a piece of whatever pie is being sheared. Additional to that problem there is the problem of being on a small place where there are no clubs 
There are no fellow synth enthusiasts to exchange or sell gear with. Anytime I want to get rid of a synth and get another one, it's got to go out to another country. Because there is no market on this island for any kind of synth gear. I'm hopefully trying to find some people that I could start a club here, but the numbers of people are very limited who are interested in synths. And unfortunately, the numbers of people who are addicted to all synths or even ancient sounding synths is disappearing quickly. With each passing generation, they see absolutely no reason to bother with a gigantic synthesizer. Even Synth Punk himself doesn't see any reason to bother with a gigantic synthesizer like this. But from my point of view, from my point of view, whatever money I invest in the modular like this, I have more control over because each module is individually replaceable and moreover a single module can be easily sent in the post or even if it has to be dumped it's hardly likely to be a large sum of money. If I bring in a complete synthesizer that is a complete instrument with keyboard and everything, it has to go as a package. You cannot simply pull out a module, buy some from another manufacturer and stick it in there. So the overall instrument may be more costly in the long run, but at the same point in time it is more maintainable because each module stands in its own right and is easy to be replaced and is actually um, uh, what would we say recession proof it is actually time proof because we have people who are constantly designing and making new modules so today is the beginning of just a little talk to let you know of the whole state of the synthesizer market and the dawn of 2023. Believe me, watching me is not as exciting as watching the synth punk. However, I have handled some serious thoughts and questions that you, the user, may wish to think over before making an investment in 2023 in synthesizer gear. And whatever your final choice, just remember that we have one thing in common. We are all radically, fanatically involved with synthesizers. See you in the next video and do have a happy and a prosperous new year.